somebody read. Let's just go from nine, verse nine, to the end of the chapter. Somebody would read that for us, please. Daniel chapter 12. We'll start there in verse nine. Go, and go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed to the time of the end. Many shall be purified, made white, and refined, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. And from that time, that daily sacrifice is taken away, and the abomination of desolation is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Blessed is he who waits and comes to the 1,335 days. For you go your way to the end, for you shall rest and will rise to your inheritance at the end of the days. All right. I think we made it through verse 10 and we stopped there at verse 11 last time. And uh, we talked a little bit about the daily and the abomination of desolation um, and the different abominations and desolations that we looked at in the Word of God. Uh, where we stopped short on verse 11 is the 1,290 days. First of all, we've got to be convinced that we need to apply day for year principles. And this isn't literal time. So how do we show that? How are we convinced this is day for year, like it says in Ezekiel 4, 6, or Numbers 14, 34? What's a good way for us to be able to show that this is not literal time, but a prophetic or apocalyptic time? Well, it says Daniel's not going there. <laughs> okay. I see the end of it. So we know this is something that's going to happen way in the future, right? Okay, that's a good point. I was thinking it, it says here that the words would be shut up till the time of the end, but then you need that refers to 1798 and beyond. But then you need the day for the year principle, which 1260 days. That's a good point. So the context is that time period, isn't it? We spent quite a bit of time showing that 1798 is the beginning of the time of the end, right? So we have this time period, and the context of these time periods is given to us in Daniel chapter 12, verse 7. And what does it say there in Daniel 12, 7? And I heard a man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river, and he held up his right hand and his left hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever, that it would be for a time, times, and half a time. And when the power of the whole people had been completely shattered, all these things shall be chosen. So it, it's talking about the time, times, and half a time in Daniel 12, 7. And what is this in literal time? 1230. 1260 days. So it really means 1260 years in literal time, right? Okay. How do we know that? There's seven different verses that says it. All right. Remember how we went to Revelation chapter 12, and verse 14, and it has that. And then talking about the exact same event in Revelation chapter 12, verse 6. It has this. So that's how we know to equate the two together. Okay? So that we have this particular prophecy is the context of the other two that we have here in Daniel chapter 12, verses 11 and 12, don't we? Okay? There's another time mentioned in Daniel 12, verse 11. That's right at the beginning of the verse. It says the time that the daily was taken back. So that's referring us back to Daniel eleven thirty one. It's a time period. So the daily being taken away, and we talked about how the daily represents Christ's intercession in the heavenly sanctuary, and the daily being taken away is when the Roman Catholic Church system or the papacy is set up on this earth to take our minds off of Christ 
as our intercessor and putting it on a system on this earth. And uh, that is taking the daily away. In other words, instead of going to Christ and confessing your sins, you're going to a priest. Instead of looking to Christ as the head of the church, you're going to the Pope. You see, it was a whole system set up to take away our eyes off of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary onto a system on this earth. So when we get, if you notice how when we get to this time prophecy, what introduces this time prophecy is the question, how long? 12.6 says how long, and he answers how long with this. Notice in Daniel chapter 8, we have a similar phrase. In verse 13, we have these uh, holy ones speaking with one another. And the question is asked, how long? And then we're given the 2300-year prophecy, right? But it's only in, in Daniel chapter 8, verse 14, it's 2300 days, and we apply the day for your principle. So when you see these little phrases in the book of Daniel that introduces these time periods, you need to look to see, you know, if there are similar phrases, that means we need to uh, apply the day for year principle in a similar way. So we believe the 2300 evenings and mornings of Daniel 8, 14 is really 2300 years. So we apply the day for year there. And we can see the same type of phrase introducing this time period given to us in Daniel chapter 12 is also given. We should use the day per year there. Does that make sense? Okay. Bye. What about uh, Revelation chapter 10 and verse 6 says, time no longer. Right? So in Revelation chapter 10 and verse 6. Keep your uh, jump drive back. Yeah. We didn't, I never did download the sermon today. Oh, you're not doing a sermon today, are you? Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. It's okay. <laughs> well, so Revelation 10 6 talks about this angelic being, this heavenly being, which really represents Christ, holding a book open in his hand. And we ask the question what book? We're just summarizing because we already studied this. What book was old? What book in the Bible was closed? And the only one that we know of is the book of Daniel or parts of the book of Daniel, right? And now in Revelation chapter 10, it says it's open. And then it says there's time no longer. Now, some of your translations have what word there in place of time? Yeah. Delay. All right. So delay is not a proper translation. Okay. It's not. Delay. So if your Bible has the word delay in place of time, it's wrong. Okay. Not delay. It's time. The Greek word is chronos. And it means there's no more time prophecies after the 2300 year prophecy, which ended in 1844. So if anybody tries to tell you the 1290 to 1335 is referring to time in the future, they're all from the wrong track. It's not in harmony with the Bible. Because the Bible teaches us there's no more time prophecy between 1844 and the second coming. Okay? Really? Um, when you repeat a time prophecy, like the, if you say it, it's literal, this time prophecy is fitting in a whole line of prophecy. You have to repeat the whole line of prophecy. And so here, the daily would have to be taken away again. The abomination, desolation, and the set up of business. Very good point. So let's look at that. So we know the this longest time prophecy in the Bible, this 2300 year prophecy, right? Which goes to 1844. And it really is divided up, isn't it? We have uh, this, the first part of it is the 490 years given in Daniel chapter 9, which ends in 34 AD, right? And then within this time prophecy, we're also given this uh, 1260, that starts in 538 AD and goes to 1798. And this is the 1260. So 
you can see that if you take any of this and try to say, oh, it's not day for year, it's literal time, then you see how it interferes with all these other time prophecies that so adequately shows us like when Jesus would be crucified, right? In 31 AD, baptized in 27, and then the end of the 490 years is 34 AD. I mean, all that would be obliterated if you try to say that the 1290 and the 1335, which are within this time period, would also have to be, uh, would, it, would, it would interfere with that application as well. Does that make sense? Okay. So let, I think what's going to make better sense is when I show you what the 1290 and 1335 is, and you'll see how it fits within this, okay? All right, so I'm going to erase the top of this board. And notice the, what's the first time prophecy given there in 12 verse 11. Okay, so the context is the 1260, right? Time times and a half a time, all right? So this ended in, in 1798. So what I do is I take this as the ending point of the, of the 1290, and I go back to this date here, which is 508 AD, 1290 years. Same endpoint. It just shows me that there is a something else that happens here that's helped setting up the abomination of desolation, right? That's helping to set up the Roman Catholic Church system in 508 AD. All right. Same ending point, not the same beginning point. Okay. And then I use this as the beginning point for the next time prophecy, right? which is the 1335. So it starts in 508. Gee. What year does it end with? 18. 1840 what? 3. 1843. So do you see, if you, if you apply this as literal time, but everything else is yes. prophetic time, um, then it would it would mess up the whole structure of the 2300 year prophecy. You see that? All these prophecies are within the 2300 year prophecy. That's the overarching large prophecy given to us in Daniel 8 14. So all of these other prophecies here, all these other time periods are within the 2300 year prophecy. Remember how Revelation 10 6 says. No more time prophecies after this between 1844 and the second coming. So what happened in 508? Why is 508 significant? Remember, the context is taking away the daily and setting up the abomination of desolation. Brother? Right? There's one point about 1844, no more time prophecies. That's why Ellen White could say Christ could have come any time since it. Exactly right. Yes, brothers. Refresh my mind on what the abomination best election was. Again. Setting up of the Roman Catholic Church system, right? Which takes away this idea that Christ is our intercessor in the heavenly sanctuary. Tommy. Yeah, the, the daily is the tamid, right? That's the Hebrew word for daily. And if you look how it's used in the earth sanctuary service, it's applied, it really means continual. Daily is, is kind of a, in some people, you know, some of your translations, you have the word sacrifice, though. Well, yeah. they know that it does refer back to the sanctuary service, but daily isn't necessarily the best way to translate tamid. It means continual. When you look at uh, the bread, the showbread, uh, you know, on the table, it's continual. If you look at the uh, the oil for the lampstand in the holy place, it was continual. Look at the the incense; it was continual. All these things uses that same adjective tamid, this Hebrew word meaning continual, 
and it refers to Jesus continually interceding for us in the heavenly sanctuary. So the abomination was is doing away with that? Yes, yeah, correct. Or man, and they do it. Right, right. And how do we know that for sure? Look at Daniel chapter 8, and it gives us specifically how this attacks the sanctuary. Daniel 8, verse 11 says, by him, the little horn power, the daily is taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. You see that? The little horn power in Daniel 8, 11, the Bible says is going to exalt himself as high as Christ, the prince of the host, and by the little horn power, which represents the Roman Catholic Church system of the papacy, the daily is taken away, and the place of his sanctuary is cast down. And notice in verse 12, it says he cast truth down to the ground. So what he's doing, it's not that the human beings can go to heaven and cast down the sanctuary in heaven, right? What it means is the truth about the sanctuary in heaven is obliterated in the minds of the people, right? What do we call it the dark ages? Because the Bible's hidden, right? The meaning of the Bible is hidden from the people. So and their minds were darkened to the truth about Jesus being our intercessor in the heavenly sanctuary. That salvation is through Christ and Christ alone. See, the Catholic Church came up and said, well, salvation is through the church. You follow the, the regulations and the creeds of the church, and you can be saved. Uh, the Catholic Church says that the Pope is the head of the church. The Catholic Church said, go to the priest and confess your sins. To get absolved from the sins that you've committed, right? These are all, this whole system is in place of what Christ is doing for us. The Bible says that Christ is our mediator. Christ is our intercessor. Christ is the only way to salvation. Right? When we pray, our sins come up to Christ at the altar of incense. And um, that's where prayers come up at, at the altar of incense. And God is in the most holy place. Catholic Church built a confessional where people come up as if it was the altar of incense, confessing your sins through a screen or through a veil, like the priest would be God in the most holy place. That's an interesting point. Do you see the parallel that they tried to apply? You know, there was a veil between the holy place and the most holy place, right? And the altar of incense was in the holy place. You put the incense on it. It represented the prayer going over the veil into the most holy place where God, the Shekinah glory, was uh, there representing God's presence. So the word anti meaning in place of is where we get this anti-Christ thing because it was in place of Christ's ministry. It's why I'm sitting just early. Uh, That's why Martin Luther wrote his pamphlet how the put papacy in the Roman Catholic Church system, and I'm talking to people in the views, not in the system, was put in place of Christ. Mm -hmm. He called it Antichrist. What do you think if you went to your Lutheran friends and said, you know, sound of the Lutheran Church said that um, the papacy was Antichrist. Well, that's, that came from Martin Luther, right? And the other Protestant reformers also believe the same thing. This isn't Adventist. This is a Protestantist. <laughs> Adventists are finishing the Reformation. That's exactly right. Now, when we study Revelation chapter 17, you see that the professed Protestant churches, they tend to go back to the Roman Catholic Church, not necessarily physically, but ideology and their theology. It's just like when you look at end time events and you study eschatology, this idea of a seven year tribulation and an antichrist appearing in the middle of seven year tribulation is, is Catholic eschatology, not Protestant. You know, that's when I tell the story about going to the antiquarians and looking at these old commentaries before 1850s of these other uh, Protestant churches, and no Protestant church believed that. It wasn't, yeah, no problem about the seven year tribulation, Antichrist appearing there. See, the Catholic Church is like, oh, the Antichrist isn't back in Martin Luther today. No, 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 it's in the future. It's in the future. And the prophets go, ah, I think they're going to believe that. But now they believe it. That's what they teach in their, in their seminars and sermons.
And in order to do that, we have to take the 70th week from where it should be and put it 2,000 years into the future. Yeah, they take this week right here and they move it to the future. 2,000 years. Over. Well, they don't even know how far to move it. They just say it's in the future. And that's the scary thing about this. You <laughs> never reach it. You never get there, right? It's always in the future. We're not we're not there yet. That's in the future. Oh, the Antichrist isn't here yet. It's in the future. You know, that's what they say. That's what the devil wants them to do. That's what the devil wants them to do, right? Put it on. So tell us about 508. Okay. So wh what's the context? The context is the taking away the daily and the abomination of desolation, right? You see, that's the context. Of these two time periods, the context is taking away the daily and setting up the abomination of desolation, right? Isn't that the context? Right. We went back to Daniel 8 and saw that the same thing is talked about there, and we got a better glimpse of what it means by daily. It means the continual intercession of Jesus as our high priest. The abomination of desolation is setting up a system on this earth to take our eyes off of Christ and putting it elsewhere, right? And so the Bishop of Rome at this point in time doesn't have the power of the papacy that he has today, okay? As a matter of fact, it wasn't until the decree was given right here in 533 by Justinian saying that the Bishop of Rome was going to be head over all the holy churches now. Okay, that was in 533 when he issued that decree. But the problem is this. The Bishop of Rome didn't control Rome. Who controlled Rome in 508? Constant. Ostrogos. Oh. Remember how in Daniel 7, uh, how the Roman Empire was going to divide up the 10 and and then three of these are going to be uprooted. One of the three is the Ostrogoths. The Ostrogoths controlled Rome at this time. And the Visigoths and the Herulani also were the other two tribes. So what happened in 508 was the first king of the Western Europe who decided that he was going to use his military might to support the Bishop of Rome. It's the first time. The first time this happened, you see, 508. In 496, Clovis, king of the Franks, converted over to Catholicism. And what does he do in 508? He finally uses his army to support the Bishop of Rome and to battle against the Visigoths. That's what he did in 508. What is this doing? It's setting up the abomination of desolation. It's setting up for the Pope, I mean, for the Bishop of Rome to become the Pope. Okay? That's starting the process there in 508 with him battling against the Visigoths. See, the Visigoths, the Ostrogoths, the Heruli, they were all against the Catholics. They were. They were against the Bishop of Rome. And specifically what they were battling about was Arianism. You know what Arianism is? These three that were up They were Arians. Remember, didn't they, right? What it means is they didn't believe that Jesus was God. Okay? They didn't believe that Jesus was God. And so, oh, brother, go ahead. They also did not believe in the Trinity concept. The Catholic Church would label anyone who didn't believe the Trinity as Aaron. That's a great point. So if you don't believe that Christ is God, then you're not going to believe in the Trinity, are you? Right. right? Or the Bible calls it the Godhead. And if we even have that same struggle today, don't we? People who are anti-Trinitarian, uh, they're kind of following along the same vein. Well, those three were uprooted like Daniel chapter 7 predicted they would be. And one of the uprootings was happening whenever Clovis, king of the Franks, used his army to be able to attack the Visigoths so that the Bishop of Rome would be in line to ultimately become the Pope, head over all the holy churches. That's why 508 is so significant. What year was Berthier? Where was he in all this? Berthier is up here. Oh, okay. 
1798. That's where Berthier is at. Somebody else, to brother? Um, what Clovis did was fulfilling Daniel 1131, where it says, Arms shall stand on his, the papacy's of time, so they shall flip the sanctuary strength and shall take away the fear. That's right. So he used military might in order to be able to set up the Bishop of Rome to have this type of power in Europe. Before 508, the kings of Europe had control and power over the church. But starting in 508, you start seeing the swap where the Bishop of Rome starts having control or influence over the king. <clears throat> okay? So this, this process of flipping over started there in 508. That's why 508 is such an important time because it's the beginning of that process where instead of the kings being over the Bishop of Rome, now the Bishop of Rome is having influence over the king. And ultimately, you can see later on, especially with the later popes, how the kings would go and bow down to the Pope, like Charlemagne, when he was crowned king of the Holy Roman Empire in 800 AD on Christmas Day. Who put the crown on his head? The, the Pope did. What was the Pope saying? You might be over the empire, but I'm over you. Right. You know, that's what he was saying in symbolism there. Right? So, Pastor. How come the Ostrogoths turned against the other two? The Ostrogoths were the ones that helped one of the other. And they were all here. Why, why, why the split there? Well, you got to understand that they're barbarians, right? And they also wanted power and control. So it's not just about theology or the way they understand God. It's also about power and control. Uh, it wasn't strong enough to hold them together then. Oh, no, no, not at all. They, they, they were never really together as a group. But they were all Aryans. Right. What? Yeah, they weren't, they weren't necessarily friends with each other. <laughs> Theodoric was the, the king of the Ostrogoths. You remember what Napoleon did when uh, he was crowned? No, what did he do? Uh, 1799? Yeah. Well, he took the crown from the Pope and put it on his own. Oh, <laughs> you remember Berthier goes down and captures the Pope in 1798 and takes him into exile back in France. And it wasn't until 1799 that Napoleon Bonaparte uh, assumed control of France. Okay, before they were controlled, you know, whenever the French Revolution took place, they ultimately were controlled by the Directory. Right, and there were five men who controlled this, oh, and uh, Napoleon was one of the generals, and Berthier was one of the generals, but Napoleon was the one that came out on top and ultimately took the power away from the directory and assumed control mm -hmm. as an emperor over this empire. Right, okay, sister. I'm, I'm confused. I'm confused. Excellent, excellent. All right, well, I'm just gonna be honest. So, okay, good. 508, you're saying the bishop is not. In control. Right, right. But that's the start. 508, right. Of the. Right. It's the start of setting up the Catholic Church system, right? Because of a battle. Because of Clovis taking his military might uh -huh. as king of the France and using his army to help uh, go against the Arians, the Visigoths. You know, he fought against them, right? Which opened up the way for the Bishop of Rome to ultimately become the Pope. Oh. I guess uh, I guess when I read this though, it's like once it's set up, is that does that mean once twelve eleven? Does that mean once Rome is in control? Uh, the bishop's in control? Okay. Notice whenever the bishop of Rome can finally sit on the throne in Rome because the Ostrogoths are chased out by the Belisarius, right? Mm -hmm. And it, it didn't take it, it wasn't uh, just a clean neat battle that took place. Right, Belisarius is sent by Justinian to enforce his decree he gave in 533. Well, the Ostrogoths control Rome at that time, and so they go and they attack the Ostrogoths and they kick them out of Rome. Well, guess what? The Ostrogoths go, they regroup, and they come back and they besiege Rome. So, you know, it, so they, they were battling back and forth, but 538 is when... He officially... Uh, 
when they right when he can sit on the throne in Rome and control Rome. Well, we do for the 1260. You see, but it this when Clovis gave his military might to the Bishop of Rome, right? If he wouldn't have done that, this wouldn't have happened. Okay. Okay. Right? This was the beginning of this was setting it up, right? Setting it up means it takes, I mean, if you look at the Bishop of Rome, who's now the Pope, right? Pope means Papa, right? Or Father. And so he didn't have the power here that he had here in the middle of the Dark Ages. The the the, the apex of their power in the Dark Ages is in the 11th and 12th century, right? That's the apex of their power. Right? By the way, also was the time when Clovis gave his military strength to support a system that was taking away that would that was blocking the view of Christ's sanctuary. That's why that was so important to him. Who was the Vatican City? 1929. So 508. Lateran Treaty. 508. The Ostrogoths lost their power? That no, battle? no, that's Visigoths. This is Visigoths. Well, they went against the Visigoths, right? Ostrogoths no. helped to get rid of the Visigoths. So the Ostrogoths are here, and the Visigoths were defeated by Clovis here, okay. right? So this is the Visigoths, and this is the Ostrogoths. East and west. Yeah. Oh. Tom? Yeah, if anyone wants to take a deeper dive into the book of the Jesus Wars, uh, it really goes into all of that. Showed all the popes I mean, fighting, whether it was Constantinople, uh, Ephesus, and uh, Egypt with the Coptics. I mean, I, I had not realized how many call themselves Christians. That's true. Yeah. yeah. But Jesus Wars. Jesus Wars, now the book that Tom's talked about. Okay. Brother, do you have your hand up? What do you say? Uh, I think you clarified the five ways and uh, it's a little confusing. 538 to that one. Okay. So in 533, right right here, Justinian, who is the, the emperor of the Roman Empire in the east, right? He's in Constantinople, okay? The, the Byzantine area in Turkey is where he's located. He issues a decree saying that the Bishop of Rome was head over all the holy churches. In 533, but the Bishop of Rome didn't control Rome at that time, so he had to send an army. And the general over this army, this Roman army, was Belisarius, right? And they went and attacked the Ostrogoths in Rome. And that's why 538 is when they controlled Rome. The Ostrogoths lost their control of Rome, and the Bishop of Rome had control of Rome in 538. That's why 538 is important. Now he can sit on the throne in Rome, and the Bible says he reigned for 1260 years, and then a deadly wound to the head of the church was inflicted in 1798. Ostrogoths took control in 538. No. Belisarius, with the army from Justinian, took control of Rome. Of right? The Ostrogoths, they had controlled Rome. Uh, I don't remember exactly. The late four. You know, somewhere over here, they started controlling Rome, right? The Ostrogoths had control of Theodoric was the Ostrogoths uh, barbaric king. And he, I think it was somewhere in the 5490s, he actually defeated uh, the people there in Italy and controlled Rome. The Ostrogoths controlled Rome from the 490s until 538, okay? And they were defeated by Belisarius. That's why 538 is so important because they were defeated, the Ostrogoths were defeated by Belisarius so that the Bishop of Rome could take can control in Rome and sit on the throne in Rome. 508 is when Clovis defeats the Visigoths. So remember, those are two of the, of the horns, you know, from Daniel chapter 7, they're going to be uprooted, right? The Bible predicted you'd have three of them uprooted so that the Bishop of Rome could take control as the Pope and established his 1260-year reign. Remember, he didn't start off 
as powerful here as he was in the center of this reign, and then he'd lose some of his power. And of course, here we, he was stripped of all this political power. But the Bible says that the papacy would come back, have a resurrection of sin. The dead would be, would be healed. And that started in 1929 with the Lateran Treaty when the Vatican was set up. 108.7 acres in Rome, you know, which is really a country, right? When the Vatican is set up then, and ever since 1929, the influence of the Pope over the leaders of the earth has increased ever since 1929, right? Who did they control in 1930? Who did they have a concordat with in control in the 1930s? Vatican? Yeah. Who did the Vatican have an agreement with, concordat, what they call it? In the 1930s. Nazi Germany. Nazi Germany. Mussolini. Nazi Germany. This is the Axis power of World War II. Who was their spiritual leaders? The Nazis and, and uh, Mussolini with fascism, right? It was the, the Roman Catholic Church. Who helped the Nazis escape Germany at the end of World War II? It's South America. It's the South America. The Roman Catholic Church. Wow. So we documented. You, you, I even saw a, uh, I can't remember a, a documentary if it was on Netflix or whatever it was, you know, on how the Catholic Church was, was uh, helping these Nazi really criminals escape Germany at the end of World War II. There's an interesting statement here in Revelation chapter 18. These end time events that are taking place. The, the Catholic Church is working behind the scenes. And it says in Revelation chapter 18, verse 24, and in her, talking about the system, it was found the blood of prophets and saints and of all who were slain on the earth. So you can see how much, I mean, it's Revelation 18, 24. The, the Roman Catholic Church system is working behind the scenes, causing a lot of chaos and misery in this world. I mean, that's the bottom line. Brother. I think by this verse, you might include her daughter. Absolutely. At this point in time, her daughters have joined her, right? Yeah, the, the apostate Protestantism. So Babylon in the book of Revelation is the Roman Catholic Church system, the papacy, and apostate Protestantism working together. And the other part of their false trinity is what? Spiritualism, right? It's those three combined together that's fighting against God and his end-time people here in our day. Pastor, I think they have some mixed uh, loyalties in The Sound of Music, which is based on a true story that Catholic Church helped the family escape from the Nazis. So. That's true. And, and the thing about it is, it wasn't they, they publicize this like they were on the good side there. That's true. And they there are good people in the Catholic Church who do good things. I mean, we're not talking about these people, are we? We're talking about the system. We're talking about the papacy, right? And because I think they did do a good thing by helping those people, right? Yeah. And it's just like Mother Teresa. Did she do a good thing? You yeah, know, absolutely, right? I like how she was straightforward with these politicians here in the United States, too. <laughs> Jeremy. Yeah, just back to Daniel 12, verse 11, to understand the phrase setting up. It's not necessarily a year. It's a period of time in which things are set up for a particular event to take place. And you can look at now. We don't see it in front of us as one event, but you know there are things being set up that are going to lead to uh, the National Sunday that's right, exactly. So it's a it's a it's, it's a process. It's a process. Well, yeah, like we just we were looking at what was going on here with God's people. God's end time movement was being set up between 1798 and 1844, right? The 46 years, you know, John chapter 2, verse 20. It's being set up because now people saw the 1260 days it was fulfilled and they started studying the 2300 days. That's right. Mm -hmm. So that's why you had these men, and we've had, you know, my presentation a couple of weeks ago about how uh, William Miller and, 
and Wolf and these men, all you know, different parts of the world were studying the same prophecy and came to the, a similar conclusion that Christ is coming back again. I know it seems strange for us to say that wasn't a teaching in the churches back then, right? They had gone away from the Bible and they weren't teaching Christ is coming back again, right? And so whenever you had William Miller stand up and you know, tens of thousands of people in the northeast part of the United States were like, yeah, I can see that Jesus is coming back again soon. And they were studying the prophecies of, of the book of Daniel. And how did the Protestant churches respond to it? Um, down. Yeah, I kicked them out of their churches. Just like the Jewish leaders accepted, didn't accept Jesus. Right, exactly. Tom? I think what really surprised the ring when I first heard studying this, the Jewish word, and so how the book from Alexandria and then the uh, Nicene and what was the other Charlton and some of those uh, meters, they would bring to Constantinople down and three, four hundred of their own followers. They would have bloody riots in the streets killing each other over who's going to be the dominant. Uh, yeah, yeah. It just, I can't right. believe how many people lost their lives in order to create the final book. Yeah, if you look at the church councils Tom's talking about, Nicene was one of the first ones, and um, you could see this wasn't uh, godly people coming together wanting to discuss things in the Bible and come to an agreement. <laughs> you know, that's what you kind of get that impression, right? And that probably might have been the purpose of some of the people, but it would turn into like you're talking about, even potentially uh, blood being laid. A.T. Well, Jones wrote a book, Ecclesiastical Empire. That really, he really brings out all through the history of the papacy. It was, it was by dog eat dog. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly right. So, uh, have you guys studied about uh, John Wycliffe, or Wycliffe, as some people like to say, uh, when he was translating the Bible from the Latin Vulgate into English, the first time the Bible was translated into English, right? This was the 1300s, 14th century when he did this. The Catholic Church hated him, right? But why didn't, the, why weren't they successful in killing him? He died of uh, kind of old age, some kind of uh, sickness. They didn't actually kill him. He wasn't martyred by the Catholic Church. Why? Because there were three popes vying for the top dog, right? And so they were focused on who's going to be the top dog instead of uh, going over there and trying to kill Wycliffe, you see. So once that was established, who was top dog, guess what they did um, in one of their meetings, I think it was Constance, uh, Germany, where they issued a decree to dig up the bones of Wycliffe and grind them, burn them, grind them up, and throw them into the uh, river, right? Yeah, because they hated him so much. They right? went out to the ocean and spread to all. Yeah, it's symbolic. It's, they hated, again, they hated the word of God. They hated the word of God to all, right? And that's what the purpose of the Catholic Church system was to hide the word of God from the people. And that's taking away the doom. And that is, that's exactly right. Tamid. Okay, so... Tina, you still got that. You, you don't have that all oh, confident look in your face. It's absorbing. Uh, okay. uh -huh. I'm absorbing it. Okay. It's a lot of information. Um, I actually looked up something last night. I was trying to bring this out. Doug Bachelor received a postcard from the Pope. I don't know if you read about oh, it. I saw that last night when I was uh, looking through amazing facts. He got something from the Pope back in, I guess, 2015 that said, uh, Thanks for the publicity. Uh, I forgive you. <laughs> no, what? Oh, that's interesting. Wow. Yeah. I just didn't know if I... Yeah. <laughs> I, just I just thought that was kind of. I mean, that kind of shows that they're doing something. They they don't like what he's doing. You know, right. the whole I forgive you and yeah. Right. Thought that was interesting. But God's end time movement. I mean, our our purpose. You know, sometimes we're accused of Catholic bashing. We're not Catholic bashing. Because there's beautiful people in the Catholic Church. Like there is in all different denominations, right? Yes. Right? What we're saying is the Bible predicted that this system would arise, take people's minds off of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary, 
and put it on a system on this earth. That it would try to take the place of Christ. And all we're doing is saying it has fulfilled that. This is the system that the Bible had prophesied or predicted that would, would do these things. Would it say that all the churches at one point followed this? I mean, like all the Protestant churches, that there was a year at a time that they that you studied their old commentaries and you saw that they believed in what were what we're preaching as well, what we're saying, uh, absolutely. we're discussing. Yeah, yeah. Like, like Pat said, the, Catholic, the uh, most denominations now have bought into Catholic eschatology, okay? And when I was looking at these commentaries of these denominations before 1850, none of them bought into it because it's Protestantism. They were Protestant churches. They were protesting against the Catholic Church. And like you said, the Adventist Church is the, that's why I say we're the world's largest Protestant denomination, because I think we're almost the only last Protestant denomination, right, that is pointing people back to the Bible and following what the Word of God says, right? Yeah, and just back to your point about we're not bashing Catholic people, you know, I think of the word, you know, Babylon, you know, it's confusion. Right. It's a it's which is kind of enveloped by teachings, right? That are contrary, yeah. contrary to what Christ is and what Christ is. Right. So that's what you have to expose. People may interpret that as bashing, but it's not bashing the person, it's bashing a teaching. Right. What right. what they're saying, because that is what's going to lead them uh into Babylon. And the thing about it is, I would rather know the truth so I can make an intelligent decision rather than being led along and believing a lie, right? So I, 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 you know, I'm grateful that God opened my mind up and I was able to see this because, you know, I believe the way they believe. I read Al Lindsay's book, Late Great Planet Earth. I bought into the Catholic eschatology, but it never said anywhere in the book, this is Catholic eschatology, right? It never said this originated with the Catholics. He just presented it as if it was from the Bible, right? And I hadn't studied the Bible at that point in time. And so uh, I believe, I thought it was from the Bible. That's what most people think, right? But when you get to study the Bible, you see that it's not what the Bible teaches. You're shining a light on the truth. And that's every one of our jobs. You know? Well, we know the truth. It's important for us to be able to go out and share with others, right? That's what we're called to do. We're living here at the end times. We still have this period of time where probation hasn't closed and people can see and accept the truth. And there'll be many people from different denominations that will come into God's mm -hmm. entire movement because they want to know the truth. There are sincere people who are just being deceived right now. So that's that, that's kind of my motivation, you know. When uh, I found out the truth and I went out, you know, I'm thinking about one of these uh, Adventists that had the opportunity to share with me, but didn't. I, my comment back to them was, why didn't you share it? You know, I had to find out a different way, but why didn't you share it? And you could have shared it with me, right? Really? I think that's what I was coming on to the other Protestant groups. You know, it is really my I'm Lord, to take my back to the 60s. Gosh, it really is truth. It's like I love my Amplified Bible, and then I read the lay to the right. And then I actually have the, uh, we have the uh, study Bible, and for verse 12, 11, the commentary, the commentary says various interpretations of this suggestion. One significant interpretation of these days refer to the time following and they're halfway through a seven year period of tribulation prior to the fact. And I mean, you keep revealing these things. We were good, it was, it was very long, and it just, I, it, it, part of me is a little resentful because I've known it to that business, and they, they were told me about this. Yeah, that's, that, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, so it's just, uh, yeah. and it is a complete paradigm shift. In your mind, and then you go back and go, Well, oh, yeah, that is true. You know, and, uh, like I've said before, I'm happy to have on my mouth, not watch me. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, uh, it, it just all those things it's just amazing how uh, everything as you start to read it just 
That's right, brother. That's how the switch came to the Protestant churches. Uh, Darby started preaching from the Catholic Counter Reformation, putting it in the future. Schofield picked it up, put it in a Schofield Bible, and then and then everyone started learned that one through the comments. That's right. See, Francisco Rivera was a Jesuit priest who was part of the Counter Reformation. So here, Martin Luther, Zwingli, Calvin, these people from the 16th century were preaching the truth and the word of God, and it went counter to what the Catholic Church was. So they were protesting the Catholic Church. And so the Catholic Church had a big meeting, right? And they said, what are we going to do about this? And there were two ideas or thoughts that came out of this. One is the preterist view. We could just say everything happened in the past, right? So that's one view. That's called preterist. And the other one is the futurism. That came from Francisco Rivera, just Jesuit priest, trying to, trying to distract us away from this teaching that the papacy is the Antichrist. That's what specifically he was trying to do by taking the last seven years of the 490-year prophecy, including at the end of time, and saying that's when the Antichrist appears. Now you're seeing it as is in the Protestant teaching. Yeah. You know, another really good thing is to help us, and certainly help me, there's a four-part mini-series called The Days of Noah. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, that really opened my eyes. Uh, yeah, that was really good. It was awful. Oh, yeah. yeah. They did a great job. Of it. The Days of Noah. Mm -hmm. It's a four-part mini-series that you can get. I, I'm assuming you can still get it uh, as a lot of I can get the first three free, and then you have to pay for the <laughs> or you can buy the whole thing and it's about fifty dollars. Well, yeah, and they did a good job on that, didn't they? They showed the timeline and oh, on the football field. Okay. Yeah, they helped me so much with the blood and yeah. dinosaurs and the whole thing. I mean, I just really start to see things a lot, a lot better. Yeah, that was really good. Did a great job. I was just thinking about that word, Protestant. But if you look at the a positive way and a negative way, you're protesting uh, against what what some of them is they have gotten back to the Bible or the pro testaments. So they're getting yeah. back to the testament. Yeah. So there's a positive way and a negative way to look at the same yeah, thing. There you go. Yeah. yeah, that's a good point. I like that. Mm -hmm. it's like, yeah. Okay. See, so Pastor, everyone thinks they're right. Yes. Right. So, yeah. Nobody says, I'm going to go join this church because it's the yeah. second best church. Yeah. I'm going to join the second best. Yes. Yeah. The long so, whether you're an atheist or whether you're, uh, I'm right. I'm right. It's, yeah. What's, yeah. What, what I see has happened is there is no truth. What is truth? Like Violet said, that everyone thinks that they have the truth. And that makes it very frustrating, at least for me, to be sharing my truth. And so for me, I tend to stay more of this my testimony as opposed to be uh, speaking truth, right? I can speak to what God is doing for me. Right That's true. When I first learned these things, Tom, I was energetic and wanted to share it with people. So I went to my brother-in-law to share it with him. He's a, he was a Vietnam uh, Green Beret, okay? Give you an idea of what it was like. He's passed away now. And so I started sharing with him, and he stopped me and said, who made you my spiritual guru? Right, and then I gave my testimony. He didn't say a word. When's my testimony? You can't deny it. Can't deny a testimony, right, brother? What's important? Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. That you our testimony too. But he's also. This is all about hiding Christ from, right. from the world. Exactly. And so the truth on the prophecy is vital. Jesus saw it was so important that he said, I'm opening a door that no man will close. What? The, the final door is the most important. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I want to recommend, uh, Patrick wrote a book about Daniel chapter 11. You know, and he's got some very good things in that book. If you guys wanted to get some information from him about how to get a hold of that book. I thought it was a very good book, a very good reference. I think you'll find it fascinating. Mm -hmm. So, any further questions? It looks like to me that we're finishing up on the book of Daniel, right? And I've heard some people say that we want to we want to jump right over to the book of Revelation and start going through it in detail, right? I see some people shaking their heads, yes. So, so we'll go through the book of 
revelation. It'll, you know, it's probably, what would it spend two years going through danger? <laughs> <laughs> okay, brother. What happened in 1943? Oh, what happened here? That's in the other right. Okay, so they're proclaiming the second coming of Jesus, right? Okay, they, and so at first they thought, uh, the end of the 20th century year prophecy could be 1843. Then they, you know, of course, they did the math and said no year zero and figured out that it was 1844. But during 1843 to 1844, what does it say? What does it say here in the Bible about that? Notice this word that it uses here. Blessed is he who waits and comes to the 1,335 days, okay? That's that's uh, 12, 12, right? Blessed is he who comes to this. All right, so when I'm reading these people who live in the Millerite movement or the Advent movement at this point in time, and Ellen White is one of them, she writes about that was the most blessed experience of her whole life was this year from 1843 to 1844 when this uh second coming was being and there there were i don't know hundreds of thousands of people in the united states that were accepting the message right it was just a wonderful blessed time proclaiming the second coming of jesus well imagine if we said that well he's gonna come yeah pastor what about the other people that discovered this did they have a huge following like miller did i don't know we're not i don't know okay brother there is another blessing because the papacy did such a good job of hiding christ in the holy place that's why they made the great discord they thought the sanctuary was planet earth exactly so the blessing would be that that the sanctuary would be restored and they'll see Christ in the most holy place. Amen. Amen. And a door would be open that no man. Amen. Really? Uh, he says plainly in the Bible, no man knows the hour that Jesus is coming. How does right. it come to an hour? I mean, that's, you know, like that's, I just don't get that. Yeah. Well, Samuel Snow was the one that actually came up with October the 22nd, 1844, right? Really? That was the tenth day of the seventh Jewish month, the antichipical day of atonement. And that's how he calculated it. He used that tenth day of the seventh month, and it was October 22nd, 1844, in that year. And that's when they thought <clears throat> the day of atonement was when Christ was going to come back to this earth because they thought that the earth was the sanctuary. Even though it says that nobody knows the day or the hour. Because they didn't realize that it was talking about the heavenly sanctuary. You see, when you obliterate the teaching of the heavenly sanctuary in the minds of the people, you get a misunderstanding of prophecy. And that's where they, they, had, they had the calculation right. They just didn't have the event correct. Rhonda? Okay. You know how the verse says, no one knows the day or the hour. I think also, you know, God sometimes lets you not see something because you need to be searching someone else, something else. You know, my parents went to the same Revelation seminar. They listened. They were both there for every meeting. They both didn't hear something different from that the others heard. That if they would have heard that, they would walk away and not gone back to the seminars. You know, I think that God could let them overlook that because they were trying to preach this message. And they would have stopped and been like, we've obviously got something wrong. Whereas as soon as it the disappointment happened, God opened their eyes and were like, oh, hey. Yeah. Hiram Edson, it's almost like he had a vision of the heavenly sanctuary. Right? I said, oh, it's not talking about the earth. It's talking about heaven. And then they studied it out. And sure enough, they were right. Yeah. The other side was that. Well, with Jesus, but kind of the same way. They didn't really understand until after the event what he was talking about for the three years. Of the day. That's exactly right. Yes, we did them out. Sometimes, sometimes we don't see it when we're in it, right? Yeah. So and that's basically done. that's basically when the books were when the time when the prophecy was opened again, so we could understand it. Yeah, we have this idea that it's sealed to the end of time, right? Right, Steve? Right. There's but Daniel told him, close, shut the books, 
the, this is closed until the end of the time of the end. And in 1843 and 44, that's when they were opened again because they were reaching the time of the end. So in Revelation chapter 10, toward the end of the chapter, it talks about how Dan, I mean, how uh, John, representing God's end time people in the vision, is taking the little the book and eating it, and it's sweet to his mouth, bitter to his stomach. And then we have him being told in the vision, do you prophesy again to these multiple different people right throughout the world? It's representing God's end time people being established after the great disappointment, right? They were bitterly disappointed, but then they were told to go throughout the whole world and proclaim these truths to the world. And that's what, where the Seventh-day Adventist Church came from. We were established to do this, to, to proclaim these truths to the world so that people can be ready for the second coming. Right? Well, and then the next thing, because there's no chapter division. Right, right. And the next verse 11. Yeah, verse 1 says, Rise, measure the temple of God, the altar, and then that worship there. Yeah, they had an understanding of the heavenly sanctuary. Right? Do you understand the heavenly sanctuary? You're not going to buy into this idea that Sunday's sacred or that the dead are already in heaven. Right? You're not going to buy into these things. Right? It's kind of the hub of these different theological teachings there in the Bible that they all center on the sanctuary, right? When you stay in the sanctuary, you see these wonderful truths. So I think it's a beautiful thing to do. That's why we've had in this church, it's our biggest contribution to Christianity is bringing to light the truth about Christ and the heavenly sanctuary. You know, I think it's time for us to be able to end Sabbath school. We'll, we'll start next time on the book of Revelation, right? We'll start with chapter one, verse one. Father in heaven, we thank you for these great truths in the word of God. Help us be faithful to sharing with others at the right time, in the right way. We want you to guide and lead us. And we just pray for the Holy Spirit to fill each one of us and help us experience your presence this Sabbath day. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for coming. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Good to see you all in line. I'm glad you're able to join us. <laughs> oh, yes. Hope to see you all. Morning, Pastor. Wow, what happened?